All right, folks, welcome back to Chapter 14, Part 2. Uh, this was Coasts, basically, uh, Part 2. Um, here we're going to talk a little bit about some of the different coastal hazards uh, that occur. And uh, one of the biggest hazards that we're all aware of is, of course, hurricanes, right? Hurricanes, a.k.a. cyclones, typhoons, right? So it's a hurricane. just depends what ocean basin it's in. Hurricane around us here. Right, uh, cyclones in the Indian Ocean, typhoons over by Japan, right? All the same things, just different names, depending on what ocean basin they're in, basically, right? Uh, all hurricanes uh, start their life in the tropics. It requires actually fairly warm sea surface temperatures, 82 degrees Fahrenheit, basically, sea surface temperature to start uh, a hurricane, because, of course, a hurricane gets its energy, derives its energy from uh, the, the heat in the ocean. So the warmer the oceans, uh, the larger and more powerful the storm can become. Uh, basically, a hurricane is a giant low-pressure disturbance, right? So uh, basically what you have is a low-pressure area, right? And, uh, you know, the winds and Earth's rotation then takes it and starts to spin it again, you know, due to the Coriolis effect, right? Uh, the evaporation or evaporation removes uh, heat, energy, and water, of course, from the ocean, and this is what, what drives a hurricane. Uh, and then, of course, in the center, right, as all of this stuff is being drawn up from the oceans, in the center, to replace that, uh, cool, dry air is being, being sucked in, basically vacuumed in to the center, and creates a, uh, a calm area that we know as the eye of the storm. The, right outside of that is the eye wall. The eye wall is the most violent part of the storm, but then you get the eye of the storm, right? And that's a, an interesting, um, uh, very calm area in the center of the storm, right? And again, due to the Coriolis effect, um, Earth's spin creates a, a, a rotating system. Uh, here's another good little video. It's not terribly long, but uh, go ahead and watch this. Just explains uh, different hurricanes and different uh, um, um, uh, hazards associated with hurricanes. Uh, but the uh, scale that hurricanes are ranked on is known as the Safar Simpson scale. And a hurricane, it starts not as a hurricane, but it starts as a, a low pressure system. First, we get what's called a tropical depression. Right, and then about, I think it's 36 or so miles an hour, uh, consistent wind speeds. Then you get a tropical storm forming, right? Uh, and then the hurricanes themselves are all based on these maximum kind of sustained wind speeds in the eye wall here of the hurricane. So once you reach sustained wind speeds of 74 miles an hour, you technically have a hurricane, right? So a, a, um, a tropical storm, is the same thing as a rotating system, but it just hasn't reached 74 mile an hour sustained winds. And then all the different categories, one through five, five being catastrophic, right? Um, these are all just based on uh, different sustained wind speeds, right? I think uh, uh, what we've seen recently, though, is that we have a lot of really large category fives. Uh, if there was a category six, uh, uh, ones like Hurricane Michael or Hurricane Dorian, sorry, and Super Typhoon Mancut would have been classified as category six, but we don't have a category six. This is one thing that uh, people have been talking about is maybe we now need to add a category six because we're having stronger and stronger storms. Why? because we have warmer and warmer sea surface temperatures. Right? So here's a bunch of hurricanes. You don't really need to watch too many of these, but uh, just to talk about a couple of those, Hurricane Dorian, of course, you know, the catastrophic one that hit uh, the Bahamas last year. Uh, this is, you know, just a destructive, you know, super powerful hurricane. Uh, Hurricane Michael, uh, was another uh, category five hurricane and Hurricane Florence, which was a category one or two when it hit land. But the big thing about Hurricane Florence and actually Hurricane Dorian is you literally could have outwalked these hurricanes. They were moving. Now they have sustained wind speeds, but the, the actual storm itself was moving. Uh, in the case of Hurricane Florence, one, two, three miles an hour in the curse of Hurricane Dorian, it actually stalled at some point. So as you watch some of these, 
right? And then uh, here's Super Typhoon Main Cut, one of the really powerful uh, storms uh, that hit uh, Hong Kong and the Philippines a couple years back. Um, you know, seeing watching these videos, just think about you know those poor folks in the Bahamas that was moving at you know zero miles an hour, one mile an hour, right? So some of these folks were these poor folks were in these Category Five conditions for you know literally 36 40 hours it was ridiculous right here's some pictures of hurricane damage i forget where this one is here uh, but here's some boats up on the side of the mountain uh this one was hurricane sandy i believe uh this is hurricane katrina of course and we talked before about how those levees broke and how that uh, uh affected the the uh the flooding of that area and this is after a hurricane that hit um uh, uh, Haiti, I believe, right? Now, on most of these, I'm not going to play the videos, but this one I do want to play for you. Uh, this was a, uh, a, a student project created by Joe Branch last semester uh, for one of my other classes. He made this song about hurricanes, and it's absolutely amazing. So I'm just going to play this for you here. I've also linked it, so please enjoy. I hear the sirens telling me evacuate. I see the rainy clouds is pouring. Police up keeping the traffic in place. I ain't not lying. You'll be a fool if you stay. Waves big enough, they gon' sweep you away. The storm that I'm talking about is hurricanes. Hurricanes, hurricanes. Two trillion gallons of rain per day. Wind speeds to 15 feet high. So waves, no tidal waves, but tides for days. Hurricanes, hurricanes, two trillion gallons of rain per day. I hope that you'll be safe in every way. When you see a hurricane, stay away. I only have my messages and I won't lie. Just be careful, don't get caught around the storm. I better evacuate if it's possible. You gon' die if you leave, you won't die. So please just don't die. I'm talking hurricanes. Katrina, Hurricane Andrew, Hurricane ERB in Sandy too. The deadliest hurricane was in Texas. People lost their lives and they lost days they thought was precious. I only had my best interest and I won't lie. The deadliest part of the hurricane is a storm line. We hit speeds that so fast and waves get so high. They get so high, I want to know why. Summer is our own, prepping a storm We start to spiral, the eye is full Move towards the limits and crash to the shore Category 3 through 5, it's under big and storm I hear the sirens, telling me evacuate I see the rainy clouds is pouring Police up keeping the traffic in place I ain't not lying You'll be a fool if you stay Way big enough, they can sweep you away The storm that I'm talking about is hurricanes Hurricanes, hurricanes Two trillion gallons of rain per day No wind speeds to 15 feet high So waves, no tide, no waves But tides for days Hurricanes, hurricanes Two trillion gallons of rain per day I hope that you'll be safe in every way When you see a hurricane, stay away yeah. Wasn't that absolutely amazing, folks? Here it is. You can check it out here again. That was created by one of your fellow students there at Grand Valley uh, last semester. Uh, you can check it out here and a bunch of other amazing creations that uh, uh, students have made um, throughout the semesters here at Grand Valley. Now, another uh, um, hazard that comes associated with hurricanes is a storm surge, right? A storm surge is associated with hurricanes, moves along with the hurricane. So as you get hit with a hurricane, you also get hit with the storm surge. And the storm surge is a rapid rise in sea level, uh, moves along again with the hurricane. You get hit with basically the eye of the storm as well as this 
the storm surge right at the same time. These can be up to 30 feet tall, and in fact, the ones that, that uh, were associated with Hurricane Dorian were uh, very close to 30 feet tall, um, tall when they hit the Bahamas. And the issue there is some of the Bahamas islands aren't even that tall, so it basically inundated the entire islands. But this is due not only to the wind, right? So, so yeah, wind-driven surge, right? But also, remember, this is a low-pressure disturbance. And because it's a low-pressure disturbance, it kind of acts sort of as a vacuum, if you will. And so there's actually a pressure bubble that kind of moves along with this as well. And those both kind of add together uh, and, and they hit you at the same time as the hurricane moves on shore. Now, these can flood 100 miles of coastline, not inland, but, you know, parallel to the coast, basically kind of where the most intense part of the storm makes landfall. Again, they result from this low pressure disturbance uh, in the eye of the hurricane, right? And as we talked about with other natural hazards, right, whatever has to do with water is the deadliest. And more people do, in fact, die from storm surges than from any other hurricane hazard, as you might expect, you know, because uh, it is, again, the wateristy of the hurricane hazards. Here's a couple of videos of storm surges for you to check out, right? Not to be worried about you watching all of them there. Uh, but uh, so I mentioned a lot of these features we have in the Great Lakes that we're talking about in this chapter, obviously not hurricanes, not storm surges, right? But we do have water spouts, right? And these things called seiches, right? So these are pictures here of a seiche that hit Ironwood, which is uh, in the UP, it's along the um, uh, Lake Superior shoreline there. Um, and uh, you can see here, this looks a lot like hurricane damage, right? And boats out in the, out of the water. Here you've combined your home and auto insurance, right? Uh, and uh, there's a bunch of different videos here. Um, I only want to play one or two for you real quick here. First of all, this one, and I played this one uh, strictly as a, well, hilarious, but also um, uh, natural uh, human reaction to observing one of these things. Look at that shit. Coming right at us. Oh, fuck. Alex, come here. What's Alex, that? there's a tornado right here. Look. Oh, come, my God. Come and look at it. Look at that, look at that fucking right shit. Oh my God. Get Alex. Get Alex out of here. Hurry up. You'll never see. Alex, this is coming right at us. Damn, we got to go inside. This is coming right at us. Alex. It's going to die right now. Watch. Holy shit, that was amazing. This is this is so totally cool, it's unbelievable. Wow, I got it all on video. It's coming right at us. Gotta love it's rednecks, folks. It's gonna die as soon as it gets off the water. Yeah, these are a little pussy. They don't do nothing. Hurry up! Hurry up! Hurry up! Hurry up, get out here! There's a freaking tornado oh, right in front of your house. That's bad. How cool is that? Um, is that oh the most God. amazing thing you've she ever go seen? Somewhere? What should we do? No, it, it'll die as soon as the water. I, oh we should run down God. there and see that. Yeah. That is absolutely go down incredible. there. Go down wow, there. Wow, that was cool watching it come up. It came still, up from the it's bottom. Still there. They do come up. Take, where's Wayne? It came up from the bottom. That's because the water's pulled off the water. Or water's pulled up the water spout here. That's sweet. This is in Florida, not in Michigan. Oh my God. We can all be like killed standing here on the uh... <laughs> I don't think those things are that powerful. That's it. Here's a fire car. That's really a water spout. You know, that's a water spout. So that's. That's wild. Like, I was going to say, that's not really a freaking science. It's still insane. Then it'll just go right up into the. Yeah. That was weird. It came up from the bottom it's, and it's from the. Zoe, <laughs> stay. Yeah, I'm gonna go down here. Running in your flip-flops. Never run towards that water spout, by the way, folks. been down here for three or four minutes that's wild dude holy shit this is awesome isn't it 
That's the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. Alright, I think you get the point there, folks. Kind of a fun video, but that's a water spout, and they do occur here on uh, Lake Michigan as well, in our Great Lakes as well, I should say. One second, we'll get back on track here. Uh, so we have those water spouts, and then we also have satias, and the sache is what's caused this here, and it's often caused by, uh, also known as a meteoral tsunami, uh, get a big kind of downburst or, or low pressure system, pushes a lot of water towards one end of the lake, and then you get kind of a back and forth bathtub slosh, basically, as that water, you know, that wind uh, resides and the water moves back and kind of sloshes back and forth, right? Um, they aren't, uh, I don't have any videos of, of uh, the exciting one that, that caused all this damage. Most of the ones are pretty pretty tame, and you can watch some videos of those here as well. These are all satias that, that occur in our Great Lakes. So mitigation of hurricanes, right? Don't build in hurricane-prone areas would be a great mitigation technique, but obviously, yeah, right, like that's going to happen, right? So one of our biggest, uh, uh, you know, mitigation uh, techniques is, is weather forecasting itself. So with our modern systems, we can accurately predict pretty well at least 48 hours in advance where the hurricane is going to go but farther out than that there's a little more uh, uncertainty it's a little harder to say it all exactly hit here and here and here right and uh, we saw this during Hurricane Dorian where was it going to hit in Florida was it going to hit Florida how soon would it turn north right all that kind of stuff but within 48 hours we generally have a pretty good uh, idea of where it's going to be the issue is large cities new orleans miami right these are going to need more than 48 hours to evacuate so often then you know city officials have this this kind of you know balance between when do we need to evacuate right so if you evacuate everybody and then the hurricane goes a different path now everybody's going to be pissed off right and then they come back they're mad at you and then the next time a hurricane comes they'll be much less likely to evacuate so uh and we saw some of this during hurricane dorian as well uh you know mandatory and and uh voluntary evacuation orders went out to areas that didn't end up getting hit but it just depended on where that hurricane ended up going all right for your structures uh hurricane straps for the roof foundation straps boarding windows right so here are hurricane straps for the roof and i think i've mentioned before um when you build a house the the roof isn't necessarily you know bolted to the house it just kind of set on the house because what's gonna lift you know thousands of pounds off of uh of a house well maybe a hurricane so just taking these stupid little you know 50 cent metal plates and actually physically attaching the house to the roof that can help hold your your you know your roof in place during the hurricane At the other end same thing your your, your house itself isn't necessarily um, strapped to the foundation but you can add foundation straps to help make it more secure also boarding windows this is not necessarily to keep the glass from breaking what it is is to rigid up that house rigid up that structure to hopefully keep it from uh, collapsing on you right? and as, as I mentioned earlier because uh, it is the sea uh, surface temperature that drives hurricanes and the warmer the temperatures, right, the more powerful the storms can become. So there is a, a serious concern that as we go on and as uh, climate change occurs and our temperatures of our oceans uh, continue to warm, we'll start to see more and more severe, larger category four, five, and possibly even if we add it category six hurricanes, right? Another big issue is shoreline retreat, right? And this is the landward migration of the shoreline due to, to one of, of several things. Strong storms can cause these, yes, and that's likely what caused it here in this picture. Looks like all of this beach got eroded out during one storm. Um, however, you can also be caused by sea level rise or subsidence. So either the, the, the water comes up or the land goes down, basically, right? And this isn't just a, an issue around uh, uh, oceans, but this is now and is currently a big issue around our Great Lakes. We're currently seeing kind of some some rarely high lake levels. This actually occurs on a very cyclic cycle. About every 30, 40 years or so, lake levels go up and down and up and down. And we happen to be in one of these up cycles, right? And we'll discuss this 
uh, more in the uh, in the next lab we'll actually look at some of this this uh, shoreline retreat that's occurred here around Lake Michigan and around our, our Great Lakes so pay it uh, stay tuned for that coming right again increasing frequency of major storms not only is sea level rising due to melting glaciers but thermal expansion right warm water just simply takes up more volume than cold water right uh, so again then these major storms these are, are, are functions of water temperatures and climate patterns and as uh, warming oceans continue right, models predict more and more category four and five storms and we have been seeing larger more powerful storms in the last few years right so talking about sea level rise and just looking at uh, the kind of the history of, of sea level rise between uh, 18,000 and 6,000 years ago uh, uh, about 20,000 years ago was, was basically you know the, the extent of our, our, our maximum extent of the last glaciation period right we're still in an ice age we're just in the interglacial stage of an ice age. There's two stages of an ice age, glacial stage and interglacial stage. We are currently in an interglacial stage and for everything we should be dropping back into a glacial stage, right? Um, so uh, during the last maximum of the glacial maximum about 20,000 years ago, us in Michigan here, we would have been covered by, oh, say about a mile deep of ice, right? And uh, all of that, ice right it's got to come from somewhere it gets of course you know removed from the oceans and deposited as freshwater ice in the uh um on land right so uh between 18,000 and 6,000 years ago as these glaciers rapidly melted back right we saw rapid level and uh, rapid rise in sea level right so here 20,000 years ago this was the ice extent but this would have been our coastline 20,000 years ago way out in the middle of the atlantic now right between 6,000 years and about 100 years ago, things have been fairly stable. We can tell this from saltwater marsh cores and stuff like that. But within the last 100 years, we've gone up about half a foot, right? Now that doesn't seem like a lot, but it actually it is, right? It depends now which coastline you're on too, right? So if our, our, our tectonically active coastline on the Pacific side, right? half a foot sea level rise doesn't do much but on our Atlantic side it actually ends up to be quite a lot because we have that broad low slope continental shelf right uh, so in the next hundred years or so we're predicted somewhere between another half to two feet of sea level rise right and again that doesn't sound like a lot but if you think about our Atlantic seaboard with that very slow grow, slow gradual slope down into our, our, our ocean right uh, a rise of one foot inundates about 1700 feet of Atlantic shoreline so with about half a foot we've already lost over a thousand feet of Atlantic shoreline which is why we have to keep taking those historic lighthouses and picking them up and moving them back and then picking them up again and moving them back right so um, just to, it's kind of a, a brief history right but uh, just to let you know if if all of the ice on the world melted right uh, there would be a 33 foot sea level rise major cities would be abandoned right but it wouldn't flood the entire world it wouldn't end up being water world or anything like that by any means right there have been plenty of times in earth's history where we've had ice free worlds right and of course a rise in sea level equals more shoreline retreat and we'll look at that more in in the lab uh, for next week as well Here's some videos to watch on sea level rise. Um, not terribly uh, concerned that you watch all of these, but check them out anyway here. And the last part of this, um, this chapter is just about mitigation. And we'll look at these uh, mitigation features uh, in the lab when we explore um, some of the, uh, the, the things that have been done around here in the Great Lakes to help against shoreline retreat. But the first one is our sea walls. There are these big, here's a big cement structure. It can be made out of rock, cement. Sometimes here in Michigan, we see it made out of wood. Um, this is a hard stabilization built right up against the shore, parallel to the shore. And the idea here is to keep that wave energy from eroding and eating back further and further onto shore but the problem there is you know that the, the the wave energy then bounces off this this hard stabilization and it has still a bunch of energy and it erodes the beach on the front of the uh the uh seawall so wherever you built a seawall you will lose your beach 
Here's another couple techniques that you see around here in Michigan quite often. Groins and jetties. Now, a groin is a singular structure, often built by individual landowners, such like that, right? And jetties, they're paired structures. They're both, you know, uh, perpendicular to the beach. But jetties are on either side of the channel, and the idea there is to keep it uh, the channel open, right? And what they're basically taking advantage of or stopping here is uh, um, the longshore drift, right? So in these uh, sediments, right, so we have the longshore drift, right, moving this way here, or in this case here, it's moving from here, right, to the back of the picture, right, so it's moving in this direction. And how do we know that? Because the idea of these groins is to trap sediment up current, so longshore drift is zigzagging these sands down, down current here, right, so it traps them up current, right, and starts to build onto beach. But as they trap up current, Right now, the 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 um, longshore drift and longshore current still want to continue, right? But now they're sediment starved because they've lost a lot of sediment deposited here, right? You put this out, it just dissipates the energy, disperses the energy, and you cause sedimentation. But on the back side, you cause erosion because it wants to still carry that sediment load, so it causes erosion. And the problem here is, whoops, that. So if this is your house and you built this this groin, right, and you might be built out your beast nice, but your neighbor's is going to start to go away, right, erode away. So what is he going to do? He's going to build a groin, right? And here he's going to build a groin. Here's, he's going to build a groin, right? This idea of self-perpetuation. Right. Uh, jetties, on the other hand, the idea there is to stop the longshore drift and longshore current from blocking off that, that river channel or harbor mouth or whatever. So they'll still need to dredge this out, but the idea is here to keep this open for shipping and traffic. Right. Again, the idea of self-perpetuation with these, right? So if this is your beach here and your neighbor up current builds a groin, well, it's going to start to deposit, you know, on that that uh, that uh, up up current side, right? And it's going to erode on that down current side. So what are you going to do? Well, you're going to build, a, uh, and your beach will start to go away. So you're going to build another groin, right? And what's your neighbor going to do? Build another groin, right? So this idea of self-perpetuation, right? You can see that here too. And again, we can see that. In this case, the longshore drift and longshore current are going from this lower right to the upper left here, correct? So we see trapping up current, erosion down current, trapping up current, erosion down current, trapping up current, right, erosion down current. Here's the guy who decided not to build a groin, all right? Look at all that erosion. No, I'm just kidding. That's actually a, a bay. Another thing you will see here along the Great Lakes, especially up north quite a bit, uh, you'll see these breakwaters. And instead of being like a seawall, which is built right against the shoreline, these breakwaters are built out into the lake or the ocean a little bit. And the idea here is to create an artificial harbor to stop wave action, right, and cause sedimentation rather than erosion behind the breakwater, right? Now, these do recruit coastal erosion behind the breakwater, but, you know, uh, depending on which direction the, the, the longshore current is moving and in between the breakwaters, it still is going to cause erosion, right? So um, another thing that's uh, been tried recently, right, are these new floating breakwater systems, not in our Great Lakes so much, but these are, you know, they can be adjusted to depth, so when you need them out there, they can be adjusted, and this allows longshore drift and longshore current to still um, uh, carry on underneath them un uninterrupted. Another thing that we have seen around here a little bit is beach nourishment. And this is the idea if your beach is eroding away into the lake or ocean, go back into the lake and ocean, grab that and spray it back on the beach, right? Uh, this helps to protect structures and creates nice big broad recreational beaches. However, it's very, very costly. So this is only really done in high tourist areas where having a nice beautiful beach is, is a necessity for the tourism industry, right? Uh, but you know, after for all the effort, right? And you can see all the machinery. There's there's a dredge pulling it out of the, the lake and then spraying it onto the, the beach, right? For all of this, you know, the idea, the problem of erosion still remains. So within a couple years, this is gonna erode away again. You're gonna have to do this all over again. And the cost is gonna be, you know, uh, uh, insane again, right? One of the last uh, uh, um, things that we'll see, and we see actually quite a bit now around the Great Lakes here, is natural retreat, right? Let it happen, right? Well, um, what's what happens, happens, and, and if uh, 
uh, structures collapse into the lake then let them be right but then limit building in these areas in the future right and hopefully remember lessons from last time and like I said you know uh, here in the Great Lakes we're currently experiencing high lake levels but we experienced these same high lake levels back in the 80s and a lot of the structures that we see now exposed uh, these wooden structures and stuff they're they're uh, they're all from 1980 mitigation attempts uh, from people losing their beaches back then as well. But we'll look at that more in um, the next lab. All right, folks, have a great day.